Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you, Bill Weber, for your introduction this evening. My name is Tim Sika, and uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of MTV Documentary Films, Larson Associates, and as of late, the uh, film critic for the new Nikki Maduro radio show on YouTube. So li it's live daily. You can like and subscribe if you like. But um, anyway, we have the artists here. Um, from the films you just saw. Could you guys just come down and take a seat and then I'll introduce you all as a group. Lisa Jesse Peterson. <laughs> Cinque Northern. Sarah McCarthy. Anastasia Chevchenko. And Tanas Ashogjin. <clears throat> Well, you know, I, it's it's funny. Um, having seen these films, I was I'm kind of um, I'm kind of relieved that I'm not an Academy member because I would not know what movie to choose uh, <laughs> in voting. Um, I don't know if you all of you know, but uh, these films are shortlisted for the Academy Award this year for best documentary short. And we we have a little time here, uh, uh, you know not too long 20 minutes to get to uh to all that uh i'd like to tonight but um and it seems rather criminal because we could really talk to each of these people for half an hour about the work that they've done but beginning here with um lisa and Cinque and going down the line to anastasia and sarah and then to nas the most basic of basic questions um how did you connect with your subjects and how did you come to make these films? Lisa? Or Cinque, you go first, yeah, yeah. Um. This on? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Uh, thank you for um, moderating and for this night. Uh, Lisa and I met a while ago and I had always kind of wanted to highlight, at the time she was working at Rikers uh, and writing a book about it, and I had always wanted to highlight it, but I wasn't sure how. We all went on separate projects. And then a few years later, she met a man named Norris, who's in the film. And Norris really facilitated Lisa going into Angola. And so she called me, to, and I came along to do what I thought would be like a performance shoot. Um, having no idea what was going to happen in that room that day. Uh, and once they shut us down and once the men responded the way they responded, well, then it, it became a story. And so we started building. We, we, uh, yeah. The men started reaching out to Lisa, and then we were able to like harness those interviews to really f flesh out the story, even though they had shut shut that moment down, shut the cameras down in that moment. Is there, Lisa, is there any recording of, of what you did there? I mean, any, uh, aside from what the, pri uh, the prison did? No. None. No. 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 Um, you know, when, I, when the men were um, contacting me, uh, you know, they were um, reaching out to me through their wives on mm -hmm. Facebook or using their contraband phones to inbox me on Instagram. And when I was speaking with them, I was hoping that somebody had a copy because since they were, even though our cameras weren't filming, they were still filming and live streaming. So right. I said, maybe somebody has a copy. And um, one of the men said that they actually made them destroy it in front of them. Um, Sarah, um, can you can you talk about how you connected with Anastasia? And, and yeah, sure. Um, so I met Anastasia through a woman who's here tonight, Maria Logan, our executive producer. Maria is a total badass. She Maria's has, over there yeah. in the corner. <laughs> she, <laughs> <laughs> she has law degrees in Russia, the UK, and the US, and does all kinds of uh, human rights law all over the world. She is an international woman of mystery, and every visa that we've needed for every country that we've been to on this crazy adventure, and there's been a lot, uh, Maria has made it happen. And it's not easy for Russians to get visas at the moment. And, um, and when Maria connected, Anastasia and I, uh, we just immediately clicked. 
and I'm drawn to powerful Eastern European women because my mother is Ukrainian. So I grew up listening to my mom and my grandma and my aunties all speak Russian and Ukrainian, and I couldn't understand the language. But I think at a certain point in my childhood, uh, sort of sacred feminine wisdom and the Russian language became intertwined for me. So as soon as I started speaking to Anastasia and uh, heard what she'd been through and how brave she was, and, you know, I was just endlessly fascinated by the combination of strength and empathy and sensitivity that is in this extraordinary woman. <laughs> Anastasia, you were accused of participating in a movement which posed a threat to the security of the state. That's what they said. Was it a combination of, of the things you did and said, or, or was it one thing in particular which finally made the court come to that conclusion? Well, uh, to be a criminal in Russia, it's enough to um, take part in debates, and then in seminar, and uh, just be a participant of any seminar. And then the last episode was I was uh, taking part in p political rally protesting against Putin. There was this flag that you have seen, enough of him. That was the last straw uh, for my investigators, and after that I was arrested. Undesirable, now I'm wanted. Yeah. Um, Tanas, could you talk about how you, you got in touch with the Special Olympics in Pakistan and how you uh, insinuated yourself into the community? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having us. It's very You're welcome. Here. <laughs> yeah. um, Happy to have you. Basically, I met the uh, woman who runs Special Olympics Pakistan in New York. And she started telling me about the kind of work they do, and I she she said she said to me that um, a lot of our work is going into rural areas where we hear about disabled kids and their where their families have no idea anymore what to do, how to handle them. They don't have resources. They're at their wits' end. And she told me about this one story where a social worker found a young girl living with the livestock. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, really? Like, and you guys find these people and you go? And she's like, yeah, you know, we try when we hear about it. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then mm -hmm. I realized if I keep thinking about something, then, because these documentary films take so goddamn long, that you're like, if you if you keep thinking about something, you're like, I, I, will, I will stick to this instead of, because you know, there's so many ideas that come your way, yeah. and you're like, that was interesting, and then you don't think about it three days later. But if it <laughs> keeps coming back, you're like, oh, here, and there's a film. Oh. And um, so that's basically what happened. And then I, I stayed in touch, and I was like, Ronak, I want to come, and I want to see if there's a film here. She goes, you must come, absolutely, you can stay with me, blah, blah, blah. And that was that. In, in terms of Special Olympics training, uh, is there a criteria that's used to determine who can or will participate? Well, it's for the intellectually disabled. Uh, so that's that's what sets it apart. It's not so much that you you're necessarily physically disabled. I mean, you yeah. you can be, but if you're just physically disabled, it's not enough. The main component is some sort of intellectual disability. And the, they've all been diagnosed by medical professionals, those that are participating. In Pakistan? Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you, you, it's just obvious. Yeah. The, the subjects of um, these films, um, 18,000 acres of farmland in a former slave plantation, now a prison, <laughs> populated mostly by men of color, uh, a Russian woman whose resistance to the Putin regi regime came at a unspeakable cost and horrendous personal loss and three young adult uh, three young kids really who who join a, a special olympics uh, running program for for disabled youth in Pakistan uh, uh, hoping to change perspectives in their community for the directors uh, can you can you presence what 
the experience was like for, for you to make these movies, um, the pleasures and the perils, I guess, if you will, and, and to the participants, what, what did participating in these movies um, uh, do for you? Yeah, let, we can let we can start with Tanas oh, and go okay. down the line. Um, I mean, the pleasures and the perils. I I always like any kind of new experience or adventure. I don't really like sitting at home. So the pleasure was I I I'd, I'd not been to Pakistan, and oh. that it was fantastic in mm -hmm. the sense that I was I was like just a sheer pleasure of being somewhere that is completely new um there were to most people's surprise there there were really no perils i feel i felt pretty comfortable i think i fit right in because i mean i i can pass for pakistani which helps so there were there weren't any kind of i never felt like any there was anything to be scared of um the difficulty, especially the first time, was when I went to the area where I found the the teenagers that you see in the film was it like on a personal level it was it just it made me deeply depressed and miserable so i mean i yeah, came I came sure. back and for a good month and a half, I was a vegetable and then with that, with anything else, you get used to it, and then you get used to it. Then you go back and you're like, here we are again. Yeah. Sajawal, well, his that perpetual smile on his face just was so touching and Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's, a, he's a sweetheart. Yeah. Anastasia, what what was how, what how did being filmed and having your story told what did it what did it mean to you? What did it do for you? Was it healing? Was it well, it is healing for sure. Uh, thank you so much f for coming here tonight. Uh, I was standing watching the film, um, and that's great because there are so many people who came here. And um, this is, yeah, it's healing. Every time I watch it, you know, my cheeks are red because uh, because it's like I'm again with my daughter that moment. I see her on a big screen. It means a lot to me. It's like our moment again and again. So, and it's a very private story. Uh, it was a very uh, tough decision to make to share this moment with such a huge audience. We had so many screenings, um, but I have never regretted it because I th feel it's very. It's essential to show it and uh, yeah. to tell it right now, to tell uh, how much how much do we sacrifice sometimes fighting for democracy? How many people in Russia are still resisting the regime? And um, every time I'm asking not to judge us by nationalities. Russia is uh, in in Russia. There are so many different people. We are so such a diverse country, and not everybody is supporting Russia. Many people are still fighting. Many of my friends are in jail, and what I do, I am writing letters. They are separated from their children, from uh, their families for years, for decades even, just for being uh, disagree with uh, uh, Putin's regime. Uh, so I really think it's important and uh, I will keep telling it and I'm very grateful to Sarah and MTV Docs and Maria for making this film and uh, I think it can change the attitude uh, to Russian people who are living with a terrorist in the same state because Putin is a terrorist. He uses terrorist methods uh, separating children from families threatening with, um, I don't know, oil, everything, uh, killing children nowadays. So the only idea I have now, the only mission I see is to keep fighting, and that's what I'm doing. And again, during uh, the screenings, I meet so many friends from Russian diaspora, and today I have uh, friends uh, who I'm really happy to see here from Buryatia. This is my home home region where I was born 
<clears throat> and um, everybody is nowadays standing against the regime, in even uh, being out of Russia. That's what we do. We are organizing protests. Uh, the first will be in January, the second will be in February, uh, just to show that those who are left in Russia, they are not alone, and we are all against the war, and we are all against Putin. We do not support this regime. Um, the pleasures of making this film were many. Um, I think, you know, this kind of story, I'm just sort of on fire when I tell it. It's like every cell in my body is committed to making the best possible film I can and to telling Anastasia's story with all the truth and the simplicity that it deserves. And um, the scene where... Um, where Anastasia and her family scatter the ashes of Alina, her daughter, and the dolphins show up. Um, you know, I'm not a religious person at all, but I, I don't know how to explain that moment. You know, it felt very much to me like it was the natural world rising up to support Anastasia and her family uh, because she stood up. She stood up to the single greatest threat to global security that exists right now. You know, she's a woman who is incredibly brave and ready to sacrifice and fight hard against tyranny. And they're rare. And, you know, my grandmother um, fled Ukraine because Stalin was terrorizing Ukraine back then. And it's still happening now. And you know, there were also very, very many challenges. Filming in Russia at a time when Putin was just kind of locking down everything. He was consolidating his power before the war and he was shutting down uh, as much opposition and as much independent media as he could. My whole crew were in danger. Anastasia was in danger. Uh, so we had, we worked with professional safety advisors and uh, we had lawyers stationed all the way along the train journey who had a very clear protocol of what to do if the if the crew was stopped. And you know, we shot on a very small camera, so you could just pass yeah. it off. As did a the government know camera. you were? Did the government know you were? Filming? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> no, not. no. Silly question. Yeah. No, there's no chance. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. Anastasia is pretty high on the watch list, yeah, so yeah. that would not that would not be okay. Yeah. Cinque pleasures and the perils of the. Um, it wouldn't be the perils you would you would think. I, I never at any point during the height of um, the excitement of the men felt in any kind of danger. I think the the pleasures, you know, I was surprised when we were talking to a lot of men and we had ten hours of audio of speaking to a lot of these men and the word hope kept coming up. Hope and some of these men went to prison when they were seventeen and they're forty five now. And I was trying to understand hope how. But the biggest, by far, pleasure has really come as a result of what happened that day. They weren't just excited and emotionally seen and heard. They were politicized. Activated, I think. Uh, Absolutely yeah. activated. And yeah. it turned into real world results. Yeah. And we found this out, uh, you know, much later that... no. Yeah, that Norris, who's wow. in the film, who has an organization called Vote, was able to basically activate them and bring them into his organization. They activated their families on the outside. Mm. Their families on the outside voted. They got two judges elected. They got a progressive, uh, two, yeah, two black female judges, first black woman sheriff. But the result of all of that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. So aside from those appointees, prior to Lisa visiting there, maybe one or two men would get out in every two years because they weren't looking at their yeah. cases and having them reviewed. Mm, I see, yeah. After she left, they were so excited and politicized, they started l really leaning into having their cases reviewed. And because of these new appointees, 300 men have come home since, because they were over, they were doing too much time. So that and that's wow. really because of Lisa's work but to have a film that can always point to that day and point to the work and what happened in that room is like beyond 
film. Well, it's you know? funny. I t- a lot of document documentary filmmakers will tell me they'll say they want to hope that maybe their film will have some kind of tangible impact, but they think, eh, maybe it will, maybe we, I want to think that, but in this case, obviously it was major. Yeah. And it's the power of art. If Lisa had gone in there as a lecturer, yeah, that wouldn't have yeah, happened. Yeah. She went in there as an artist and, and it goes straight to the heart you right. know, when you do that. So that by far is, is just such a validation. Was it the peculiar Patriot that you performed or was, yes, it was actually. Yeah. You want to talk about, uh, I loved your Tony award. You should I have brought it, it. You should have carried it with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that 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 was that was is still is a highlight for me. Um it, it was it was very um powerful going in into um Angola and what set Angola apart from other prisons that I had previously performed in um was the significance of the land. I say that in the film, but um I can't um you know overstate Yep. Just the energy of being in um, a Confederate state in the South, in the Deep South, in Louisiana, it's, on a plantation, yeah, 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 and yeah, I'm a descendant, yeah. a direct descendant of yeah. of enslaved people, and yeah. going back in there like a descendant of Harriet Tubman, and seeing all those faces and yeah. activating, it was such an electrical charge that I felt. And the men felt, and so there was this symbiotic relationship that yeah. was happening in the moment that something was un- like something ancient yeah. was unlocked. Yeah. That you could I, feel it in the movie. Yeah, yeah. it, it was it yeah. was palpable, yeah, and yeah. the powers that be, it unlocked their energies too, wow. their ancient energies. So there was a real battle happening that I had no idea until I was able to look back in hindsight and yeah. say, "Oh, wow." I was going into Confederate territory like Harriet Tubman went into Confederate territory yeah. and I was in a lot of danger, but it wasn't the danger. It was me connecting with the men and having to, and wanting to bring my art to activate. And yeah. that's what happened. And we had no idea that the, that the uh, impact afterwards would be so astounding. We literally found this out two months ago of these yeah. men coming home and these bills being passed and the activation of the family members yeah. and how incarcerated men, they can't vote, but they can activate their family members to be politicized to help, um, you know, change the tide of yeah. mass incarceration. So yeah. it's it's very humbling as an artist. Yeah, sure. I want to open up for, with some... For some questions does anybody have a question i want to get you on the mic because i don't like having to repeat questions and this way everybody can hear thank you so much um thank you for the wonderful films i was lucky enough to see one before but um i guess for Cinque and lisa um i can't imagine <laughs> what i would do as a filmmaker if 15 minutes before i was shut down from shooting something one, did you sneak in some audio undercover, try to do something? And then, I don't know, what would you do after? Like, to bring that back to life was just so incredibly beautiful. Like, I don't remember that from the first time I saw it, but, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, um, you know, we still had our phones, and it, the, and it, the thought crossed my mind to just kind of <laughs> tap that. Right. But I was scared. Yeah. I didn't, I just... I didn't dare do it. And and because so the the film crew, the Angola film crew that was live streaming it, we had gotten to know them. We were there the day before doing tech rehearsals. And so when our cameras got shut down, the the Angola guy, he called me over and he said, I got you. Don't worry about it. But he wasn't he couldn't really control it. You know, in the end, when they wanted to destroy it, they did. I, I think there, you know, there's a kind of destiny to this film. It just so happens that I am an artist and an editor, and I think that the animation sequences was really helped by that, because I, we were able, I was able to cut it in real time and say we don't need four shots. Let's just make it one shot, and you know we'll move out. So it just was, it kind of made use of everything you know that I knew how to do. Did you guys know each other before? this whole thing with the uh, all of us yeah yeah oh yeah you... we're like cousins oh okay <laughs> I've, okay I, it I took should... like four times before i stopped crying over the dolphins but <laughs> now i can watch it and but yeah we we know each other. did you have a did you, did you have a question yes okay i'll come right up and get you okay um 
one of the things is that I'm really thankful for is that I'm not a voting member because all of these were so good. Uh, I just couldn't vote. <laughs> uh, what's your experience leading up to the voting? How does it, how does it feel? Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> nerve-wracking. <laughs> Hello, this is Karen Lyle, and I'm actually from Salesport Talk. And so um, I was brought here not knowing exactly that this story about sailing would be what it was. And I was just so deeply moved and touched by your your story and also that experience that you had on the water because I've had many experiences on the water like that. And I just wanted to have you share what that was like, sharing that moment, um, both of you, both director and, and protagonist in the story, um, you know, with nature and, and just being, you know, having that larger experience than yourself just overtake you. Uh, you know, just saying goodbye to your daughter, whatever it is, it's uh, it's the saddest moment of your life. And uh, uh, when we uh, first watched the film, it was in Telluride with my children. They came here to the U.S. for the first time. Uh, we were crying, all of us. Um, and uh, I don't remember, somebody asked me, where is the team of the film? Where is the cameraman on the boat? And I didn't remember where they are. It was uh, our private moment. And um, I am very grateful to the team that they kind of let us do it the way we wanted to do it. And just maybe um, a couple of moments before we did it, uh, the cameraman, Dennis, uh, he said, if you don't want us to film it, we'll stop doing it any time any time, just say. And it, I was very touched by uh, what he said. And uh, we are still a team. Uh, and I'm very proud that we are still friends. Uh, many of uh, the guys uh, left the country, as I did. And um, one of them helped me to escape Russia. Um, Sarah, as a director, film director, helped my niece to escape Ukraine and uh, to get medication. She had cancer. So this, this is uh, more than just a film for me. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I, I cannot say I'm happy, but still, I can see this moment of saying goodbye to my daughter many times. And I don't want to forget it. I want to be there from time to time. Just don't to not to forget how cruel the system is, and uh, that uh, I need to keep fighting. This is my <clears throat> motivation, and I hope it's in inspiration for other people as well. Yeah, I think that when you experience a moment like that, it just sort of renews your faith in humanity and in the idea that actually there is some organizing principle in the natural world that is benevolent in some way. Vicious, yes. Raw, yes. <laughs> but still, I think there is um, some kind of, you know, I think there's something going on. And I think we all want to feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And certainly that moment with the ocean and with the dolphins and with Anastasia looking into the ashes of her child. And, and you know, since the war began, there's 456 Ukrainian children who have lost their lives. And now when I see that shot of Anastasia looking into the urn and the Russian flag in the background. Uh, I think about all of those, all of those kids too. Tanas Sawajal, what did, did he ever return to participate? Um, he, oh, uh, yes, he, the, he, after they moved, 
to a different region. They moved to the Punjab. The, the father luckily uh, contacted uh, Noor, who is the human rights worker that you see early on, and Noor hooked him up with um, Special Olympics in his area, and he has been participating. And son is off to attend the 2023 World Games. Yep, she's going to Berlin. Wow. <laughs> this is difficult because I'm a Bay Area school teacher, so I relate to special education. I had the good fortune of visiting Russia previously and felt the environment based on our tour guide that we had to be with through our entire journey. Um, but I'm really curious about Angola. Like, I'm a white person in the United States of America, and this is shame for us. What can I do to help? How can I support you? How can we elevate this audience to be there to lift like, and, and cause change? This shouldn't be the future. This shouldn't be the fields for black people. This is wrong. What can we do to shift this? Because this is my homeland and this is shame for us. So I would like to turn the conversation. I appreciate the other countries very much. I was an English language development teacher. So I, I applaud your students and I will lift them to our country. But my promise is to this country. And so I want to turn it to Angola. What do you ask of us? And what can I do to support you? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you so much um, for that question. And it's a tough, a tough question because um, there's many layers to it. Um, so there's not a singular answer. But um, I would start with your passion and that the passion that you have to want to get involved is that's the activation to learn more. Um, there is a, um, a campaign right now called End the Exception um, because in the Constitution, in the United States Constitution, the 13th Amendment says that slavery is illegal except for punishment of a crime. So the exception is except for punishment of a crime. So there's a hashtag called hashtag end the exception to get rid of slavery that is still embedded in the Constitution. So that's that's one way of getting involved. Um, and like I said, your, your passion is, um, is really touching and meaningful and I appreciate it. Um, and I think that's what's going to help make changes. People like yourselves who get moved and you want to share this information or you want to learn more information. And as you learn more information, you share. Because that's how I became involved. I, it was a correctional officer who boot kicked me down the rabbit hole. And as I learned information, I was sharing information. I became kind of like an evangelist with this, with this issue. Um, but it was from that passion, that fire, that I'm sensing and feeling from you in this moment, that I know that that fire won't go out, that I don't know what it's, where it's going to move and what it's going to turn into, but I know that you're going to do something. I don't know what, but and the exception and getting more information, and I, I, I'm just really touched by, by the question and your passion. Any more questions? Does anybody have any more? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, dear Nastya, it was really a heartbreaking story. And uh, accept, please, my deepest condolences. I uh, I think I partially understand your situation. Two of my close friends were killed by Putin's regime. And the question is, what was the hardest part of the home arrest? Probably uncertainty or uh, fear of imprisonment and uh, about the uh, future of your children or future of Russia or just a deprivation of uh, freedom. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
house arrest, I have uh, a lot of restrictions, even more than you have in jail. Uh, you, uh, you couldn't communicate to anyone. You couldn't um, leave your apartment where you live, just 40 square meters. Then uh, you couldn't call, you, you couldn't uh, use the internet, work, anything. And you need to survive somehow during two years like that, being just uh, locked in the apartment. Uh, and there are many issues for sure for my children who couldn't, uh, I couldn't invite a doctor to see them. Uh, then um, a lack of communication, it's very difficult, believe me. Just when you come to the hearing and nobody can speak to you, even say hello, because the officer is next to you. And you want to talk, you have so many things to say and to say thank you even for your support. Friends are coming, journalists are coming, you can say a word. During two years, it, it changes you a lot. So I had to protect myself from these inevitable changes, reading, writing my own book. I have read, I wrote a book about this house arrest. Uh, so it's, uh, it was not the best period of my life. But the, the, most, um, the most difficult was the thing that I couldn't be with my children outside. Not in the hospital, not uh, taking them to school. My son was just seven years old. Nowhere. That was like, you don't know what is going on. I couldn't understand what they should wear to go to school because you don't know what's the weather like. Last time I was in outside, it was winter, and now it's May, and I have no idea what should they wear. Yeah, lots of troubles. Just, I enough. just noticed your T-shirt there. <laughs> Everybody can see that T-shirt. Hi. Um, my question is for Tanas. And um, I thought that film was um, incredibly well... It's Sorry, now. where are you? I'm right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought it was a, a, a beautifully edited film and the, the, the kind of the flow of the story was done incredibly well. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the families because I do think that it's super, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to demonize them. Um, I think that you tried to show some of the struggles that they undergo, and I would just, just love you to talk a little bit about working with those families. Sure. I'm, I mean, I hope that the film does not demonize them. That's kind of one, of one of my goals was to ideally communicate that this could be you. It's just the circumstances, the lack of resources, the really not knowing what to do. Um, what would you like to know about the families? I mean, I did get the sense that there was just a lot of struggle in their lives and that they were, I mean, you know, they, they, like they were kind of facing a very difficult and impossible situation. Right. And that the culture around them was not supporting them. Well, I mean, you're, you're in interior sin. This is about four hours out from Karachi. And... Um, Honestly, what I experienced, the, the only institution that really functions is the military. Most everything else is corrupt, dysfunctional. Um, there's very little money exchanging hands. There, it, it's just, there, it's, it's survival. So really, poverty rules most decisions, right? So what you're getting are families just trying to survive and then that's already difficult, and then they have a disabled member in their family. So as a way to deal with that situation, as you see in these cases, they find a way to, in a way, control the disabled child so that at least the child doesn't run off and get raped as a girl or doesn't burn things or destroy property because that could cause all kinds of problems. Um, what is... What is in what, what is incredible is that there really is no state that helps in any way. And so, you know, you're, you're just, you're basically left to your own devices. And when an organization like this shows up, one of the, one of the more interesting moments we kept having were these families would ask 
what like really like why would you why would you help us yeah. and it would and they would be like like one of them that didn't make the film this other family the father was like he had a beautiful daughter who was disabled like gorgeous and and he was like do you want to sell my daughter like what do you want with my daughter like you clearly like you're going to traffic her mm -hmm. and there was this understanding of like ngos are corrupt everyone is corrupt what's in it for you and then to gain their trust was was interesting like that that was not easy and then it would then it would flip into do you have a program like this for my normal children like do you think you could take them <laughs> and so it was like so there, there's just not enough resources mm -hmm. and everything's corrupt and that's what you're coming up against um, it was a really similar question a similar question okay i think we have one up here <laughs> what's the distribution plan for these movies is there one? It's already on Paramount. Oh, Paramount Plus. Uh, on the how far can they run, I just wanted to let you know that when I watched the film, and I've done a lot of um, time in the bush and in Tanzania and Old Divai Gorge and other places through, I really felt that you captured the experience of being there and just relating to the people and having them reveal themselves. And because so Thank often, so, so often there's a la layer of um, other culture judgment on it, and I didn't feel that the film in any way did that. And I felt that I could could understand, you know, just because these people are living and they're engaging in their lives, and this is what their lives are, and they're interesting and beautiful people. So I thought you brought that through. Thank you. I mean, I, I when when I make films, it's really important for me to just observe. And not judge, and I, I also, I, I don't try to push any particular idea or like what I think should happen or not happen because I, as a filmmaker, I personally just think my job is to uh, to show what I see, just to observe, and so I think that helps with not passing judgment and not creating the, the what you were mentioning to create that kind of like judgment on another culture. I have an elephant in the room kind of question for you, all of you, and I, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. But you're all, um, in a way, I mean, your, your films are all being shortlisted for the Academy Award, and in a way you're all in competition with each other, but don't you all want to win? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind, of, I kind of feel like we've already all won. You've already won. I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Well, the movies, again, are, as far as they can run, directed by Tanas Ashogian, uh, Anastasia, directed by and featuring Sarah McCarthy, and Anastasia Shevchenko, respectively, and Angola, Do You Hear Us? Voices from a Plantation Prison, directed by Cinque Northern, and featuring Lisa Jesse Peterson. Lisa, I think, I think in conclusion, I think raising the fist is an appropriate gesture. Thank you all for being here, and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank <laughs> you.